Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tago Cyber's channel. Previously, I talked to Shannon about them bringing a new VIP on board. We're now sitting here with that VIP, Brent Watkins, the new Director of Business Development. Brent, how are you doing? Are you ready to dive into your experience today? I'm doing great. I am uh, ready to dive into my experience. I'm an older guy, so I have a lot of experience. So it might take a couple of minutes. <laughs> well, we'll try to consolidate it as much as possible, but there's a lot to get into. The, one of the first yeah. things Shannon had brought up was how she had originally met you, her and Troy, while you were working with the FBI as an FBI coordinator for the InfoGuard program. Can you tell us about how you made that connection with them? Yeah, absolutely. I um, attended a lot of conferences speaking on behalf of the FBI, and uh, they just happened to be at one of the conferences. And I think it was a local conference here in Las Vegas. And we, uh, we talked, we met each other, we hit it off, and we stayed in touch ever since. And I think that was probably somewhere back in about, oh, I don't know, 2013, 2014, possibly. Interesting. Can you tell us more about what it's like to be the, the FBI coordinator for the InfoGuard program? What are some of the things you handled there? Yeah, InfraGuard is an interesting program. You know, I have a varied background in the FBI. I have a background in electrical and chemical engineering, went to the FBI, got pushed towards a technical career track because of my technical background. And the FBI started that InfraGuard program to where you try to bring in the private sector, the academic sector, the public sector, come together as a group and handle uh, infrastructure threats like the oil and gas, the transportation, all the critical infrastructures that we have in the states. The goal of InfraGuard was to share information with the private sector, public sector, and also have them share information with the FBI. So it was a win-win for everybody. I became coordinator. Uh, basically, I was told to be a coordinator. It's kind of a funny story I won't go into, but it was one of the best things that happened to me in the FBI. So I, I spent years in Knoxville, Tennessee, getting that chapter up and running and getting a good group of people on a board and bringing in speakers, including myself, on a quarterly basis. And so when I transferred here to Las Vegas, I basically took over that same role here, uh, arranging meetings, arranging speakers, bringing people together, speaking myself. And also uh, that brought up the opportunity for me to speak around the, around the country on the topics of cybercrime. I mean, I. I started investigating cybercrime when there started to be cybercrime. Yeah. I was back, you know, in, in Los Angeles in the FBI office. And then about oh, 1998, we uh, stood up the InfraGuard program there. And so I was one of the, we were one of the first chapters and I stayed involved ever since. So I've been involved in InfraGuard on and off since 1998. I, I did take a break. I had a hiatus. I became a special agent bomb technician just to kind of switch gears and get out there, get a little adrenaline going. And, you know, at the end of the day, say to yourself, this is what I'm made of. I can do this. And it's a fun job, but it's a hard job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've cut your teeth on a lot of interesting things. And like you said, you've been mm -hmm. involved in the cybercrime industry since it started. So curious from there, just um, so like how has cybercrime evolved since then? Like, like, is, is it, is it crazy how much things have changed or is it just pretty much par for the course because technology has evolved so much since then too? No, I, I think it is crazy. When we first started out, uh, for example, I used to go out and give presentations in Los Angeles and say, look, people, this internet thing is going to be big someday. Mm -hmm. And uh, the patches weren't coming out very fast. It was an operating system environment where people were typically attacking the operating system, not the user like phishing today. Mm -hmm. And then over time, the systems, including cyber systems, but our network systems got so complicated over time uh, compared to back then. And when you see complications develop in a sector of IT, it opens the door to more exploits. Mm. So the number of possible exploits went up over time as the networks and the hardware and the software got more uh, complicated. It's, it's interesting because um, essentially what you're saying is like, at this point, things are so complex that there's just, just a sea of potential exploits and um, people, people just kind of what find them over time. I think the Log4j one was one that was found, and then that kind of announced it to the world, mm -hmm. and then everyone was rushing to patch it. For instance, so sure, so, that's a that's an exploit of the decade, really. Yeah. That's wild, man. So then I guess, um, was there any key ones you ever worked on? If you want to share any highlights, as you've been involved with these cyber crimes that you've seen over the years. Yeah, I um, 
you know, we started out and one of the first cases I was just telling Shannon this the other day is I worked on the first pump and dump case for penny stocks that we worked in the bureau where you had people going on message boards, uh, taking stocks that were maybe 25 cents a share of penny stocks, talking them up, making like fake press releases and things like that. The next thing you know, that 25 cent stock is $2. And these guys bought at 25 cents, they sold at $2, made a lot of money, then everybody found out later it was hype, and they all lost money. Mm -hmm. So that was an exciting case, because we'd never done anything like that. And uh, I worked the case, uh, I think it was in, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the date, but it was early on. And it was a denial of service attack on bigger names like Yahoo, Dell, Google, and it was quite effective, especially I remember, I don't remember the exact amount, but Dell uh, ended up losing millions in sales over that time before the uh, crime was solved. Uh, I'm sure they made that back. I don't follow Dell as far as their financial statements. But uh, anyway, the, that denial of service attack took down a lot of e-commerce. And uh, we ended up going up in Canada, running leads up there, working with RCMP. And it became an international case, which was the first time we had really done that from our Los Angeles office and it was uh, it was exciting and it was also uh, it was also a good feeling to solve that case and find out the original perpetrator who started that crime complex environment but we were able to zero in on the person that actually did that account wow that's so, interesting i mean when, uh, when ddos is first started there wasn't technically anything legal against them until large people start getting hit right so well, yeah, and it, it wasn't even DDoS, it was DOS, it was denial of service, it wasn't nearly as complex as the DDoS cases are now, so you've got one source of the uh, denial of service data stream, if you will, and, uh, and yeah, it was uh, pretty much uh, tested some of the new cybercrime laws that had been passed and how we were going to use the U.S. Code 1030, the Cyber uh, Crime and Abuse Act, to charge people with interfering in e-commerce. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense if you're denying somebody millions of dollars of business and interfering with things, that needs to be a crime. So that, that's yeah. pretty cool. So then going on from there, um, so now, now, like what attracted you to Tego? Like, what do you like about them? What was like, okay, I want to come on board and work here. Okay, uh, that, that's a good story too, because I am retired from the FBI. I have been sitting here retired, doing a few little things here and there, consulting a little bit. And then this opportunity with Tego came up and I kind of look at it as I came out of retirement to work with this company because it's such a great company. The, uh, the first thing, the best thing about the company is Troy and Shannon. Shannon, everything she does is top notch. She's one of the best programmers and architects I've ever known. Oh. And she understands the threat. She's written proprietary software to deal with that threat. And that combination of uh, something that's really needed in the industry, plus Shannon and Troy doing it, it just uh, really turned me on to that company. And the, the, the platform they have uh, is, to me, I mean, it's incredible. It does uh, an amazing job that hasn't been done before. It's, I mean, we have a shortage of cybersecurity workers. This addresses some of that uh, to help people get their job done without running around with their hair on fire. They have you know, instead of finding a needle in a needle stack, they're able to pull out the important data and they don't have to search through that needle stack. The customer, if you will, doesn't have to search through that needle stack. And it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of money, and it lets the companies respond more effectively to the threats. Good, good. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you after talking to Shannon and Troy here for this past, I think it's coming up on a year I've been talking to them at this point, yeah. but um, yeah, they're definitely incredibly knowledgeable, capable, and personable. That's the three yeah. things. Like they, They're a great, great team mm -hmm. there, and um, all, all the people at Tego that I've talked to is, have been very, very capable people. So you seem like a perfect fit onto the team. You're bringing years of experience. You fit perfectly into it. So then like 2022 is upon us. Obviously, last year was, it was a big time for ransomware and all that. How do you feel 2022 is going to go? Uh, 2021 was a big time for ransomware. Like you said, 2022 is going to be a big time for ransomware as well. I, I think you're going to see the, uh, the targets change a little bit. We've already seen the supply chain attacks like Kaseya and other MSP type attacks that affect not just the MSP, but obviously the MSP's customers where all the money is. And, you know, if you can attack an MSP and get access to 
2,000 other clients, that's it's a big deal. It opens up your threat landscape and you have a lot more targets. Uh, you'll still see the attacks on hospitals and critical infrastructure, such as the Colonial Pipeline, but you're going to see the supply chain attacks as well. Perfect. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I'm about to say, I don't think they're going away. <laughs> it's no, and you know, and it's not just ransomware too. It, they're, the threat landscape includes other things like denial or DDoS, denial of service, and operating system flaws and other types of ways to gain unauthorized access to a computer and to steal data and uh, do whatever damage, do reconnaissance, learn from it. And it's not just ransomware, but it's predominantly ransomware. Yeah. I guess, um, I guess the last question, because I could, I could pick your brain about this for hours. If I, given yeah, I could talk, I could talk about it for hours. So with the threat landscape, have things became more threatening? Have, has the cybersecurity world risen to the occasion every time and it remains a cat and mouse game? Like if there was a line saying like things are now at this point, are they more dire than they used to be? Or is this just how things are always going to be? The cybersecurity companies out there have the resources to do more. And they have done, in general, a better job at addressing the threat but like you said, the, the threat is constantly evolving. The systems we're working with are so complex and there's so many of them that this is not gonna slow down. And it is cat or mouse in a lot of ways or whack-a-mole. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of the ransomware groups, for example, we uh, coin a phrase, we call them our evil or revil, however you wanna say it. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, we might have some success in a case against them, recover some Bitcoin, uh, identify some of the subjects. And next thing you know, these crime groups, these crime syndicates, they dump the name, they go on, they pretend they're somebody else, and when they rebrand themselves, but they don't go away. You know, we don't have control. We don't have the ability to track and arrest uh, a lot, most of these people because of where they live and where they do this crime. Yeah, that's fair. I guess it's uh, back to the old mythological story of cutting a head off a hydra and two heads pop up where the, where the mm -hmm. one was. It's kind of hard to get a perfect cap on it, but Brent, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your sure. insight. Glad to see you in this new position and look forward to see what happens. We'd love to have you on again. And if anybody watching has any questions for Brent, don't be afraid to ask. We'll happily dive into them. But for now, Brent, do you have any closing words for people before we go? I, I just appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm very impressed with Tego, which is why I came out of retirement. That threat intelligence platform they have is best of breed. And I believe it's going to make a lot of difference in the industry. Wonderful. Well said, Brent. And again, thank you for coming on. Thank you everyone for watching and have a wonderful day. Okay. Thanks.